Good morning and welcome to the Niskanen Center Briefing on Managing the Risks of Climate Change. I'm Kodiak Hill Davis, the Director of Government Affairs at Niskanen, and it's my pleasure to be moderating today's discussion. Before we get started, uh, for our attendees, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screens, and we encourage you to submit questions throughout the discussion, and our panelists will answer them at the end, time providing. Um, the discussion this morning will focus on the recent Commodities Futures Trading Commission, that's a mouthful, subcommittee report entitled Managing the Risks of Climate Change. Also, the recent announcement from the Business Roundtable Policy Platform on Climate Change and the role of carbon pricing in addressing climate change. Um, it is my pleasure uh, to welcome our distinguished panelists this morning. Ambassador Francis Rooney, U.S. Representative of Florida's 19th Congressional District, Commissioner Rostein Benham, Commodity Futures Trading Commission, Bob Litterman of Kipos Capital and Chair of the CFTC Subcommittee on Market Risks from Climate Change, and Matt Sonneson, Vice President of Infrastructure, Energy, Environment at the Business Roundtable. I'll turn it over to each of our panelists to introduce themselves, provide a few remarks, and then we'll shift into the moderated discussion. And we'll also have some guest questions before the audience Q&A begins. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to the commissioner to get us started. Thanks, Kodiak, uh, and good morning to everyone. Late morning, of course, but I wanna take a quick moment to thank Ms. Cannon for hosting this event. It's great to be here um, talking about this important report. I also wanna acknowledge and thank Ambassador Rooney for joining us. And, Matt and for the BRT and, and Bob Litterman as well. Bob and I have been working together for over a year now on this report, so really pleased to be here with him talking about the, uh, the end product. To take a, a few minutes, I think it's important to share with the viewers um, a little bit about myself, the CFTC, for those who don't know it, um, and then some of the steps that I've been taking over the past few years to, uh, to really get to where we are today with this um, sort of groundbreaking report in many respects, um, a report about climate risk and financial markets and the risk that climate change poses to the resiliency and the safety of financial markets and how um, the consequences of, of climate change can have obviously uh, really, um, uh, really challenging effects on our economy, jobs, and productivity across the board. Um, I joined the, the CFTC, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, in September of 2017. Uh, prior to that, I spent um, about six years in the Senate working for Debbie Stabenow on the Agriculture Committee. Uh, and a lot of my sort of thinking around climate change started in those days. Obviously, climate risk and climate change is, is probably the number one challenge that uh, farmers and ranchers face um, across the country and the globe. They have, you know, since day one. So a lot of the policy that I supported Senator Stabenow on with respect to ag, ag policy was very much grounded or at least driven by uh, climate risk and, and the, the changing climate that we're dealing with uh, and that we have been dealing with over the past few decades. Uh, when I joined the CFTC, um, I started to think about financial markets and climate change. And the CFTC is a pretty unique agency. It's one of two markets regulators in the US. We have a bit of a patchwork of financial regulators in the US. Obviously our prudential supervisors are the Fed, the FDIC, OCC, um, our, our primary bank supervisors, uh, among others, and then, of course, the Securities and Exchange Commission and the CFTC, or market regulators. Uh, many of your listeners might know the CFTC from the great 1980s movie with Dan Aykroyd and, and Eddie Murphy trading places. Uh, frozen concentrated orange juice was the commodity uh, of, of the day in that movie, but we have a really large span of commodities that we oversee. If you, if you look at the definition of commodity in the Commodity Exchange Act, Really, um, you can fit about anything in there from, uh, you know, soft and hard agricultural products uh, to metals um, to, you know, energy products like oil and natural gas to financial futures, which can be um, interest rates or currency. So uh, a really big array of contracts fall within uh, the CFTC's purview. And I think that's what makes the agency particularly interesting and unique to handle an issue like this. Uh, one thing that I take great pride in and that I really enjoy about working at the CFTC is that our constituency is very broad from a financial markets perspective. Um, our, our primary and our original constituents for farmers and ranchers, uh, agricultural futures contracts date back uh, to the 1850s. Uh, and as time sort of has evolved, that, that group of commodities has grown to, to many that I, I mentioned earlier, metals and energy and now financial contracts as well. And financial contracts really make up the largest percentage of of the contracts that we oversee. Uh, 
but with that large constituency, we we in, we engage with again nearly everyone in the in the economy. Again, from agricultural producers to large manufacturers uh, to energy producers to international companies who are trying to hedge interest rate or currency risk. So it's a, a broad constituency that I think is important and that um, ends up becoming an interesting tie with climate risk and how financial markets can handle that climate risk. Um, as I started to sort of begin my time at the commission, you know, three years ago, uh, I started to think about issues that I wanted to prioritize. The commission has very unique structure where each of the commissioners can sponsor or essentially oversee an advisory committee. Advisory committees are pretty popular uh, in the government. They're great tools where regulators and policymakers can use constituents and stakeholders as sort of advisors for policy and, and recommendations on regulatory matters, really telling us what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, how markets are changing, and how we need to be thinking about uh, markets as they evolve. Um, anything from USDA, EPA, or of course, CFTC and, and the SEC as well. So as, as the individual who oversees the Market Risk Advisory Committee, um, I started to think about topics that I'd like to champion and prioritize within the context of that advisory committee. And one thing I had thought about, and sort of referencing what I said earlier about my time on the, on the Senate Ag Committee and my, and my relationship with climate change and thinking about it within the context of agriculture, I started to read and sort of educate myself on the risks that climate change could possibly pose to financial markets and the economy. I think when folks generally think about climate change, they think about environmental degradation, they think about energy production, they think about national security uh, and, and human health to an extent, but they don't naturally think about the economy per se or financial markets. Uh, but one lesson certainly from COVID and what we've seen, I think in the past few years with some of these um, natural disasters, whether it's the forest fires out in the West Coast or some of these more frequent hurricanes that we're seeing earlier in the hurricane season and having um, more of a compounding effect, uh, you know, really one after another with more frequency. We saw record flooding in the Midwest between the 2018 and 2019 period. And obviously we're seeing uh, temperatures hit record highs uh, in, in the past decade or so. So with all of these you know, elements of a changing climate, I thought, how, is, how are these events gonna start affecting our financial system? And gotta give a lot of credit to folks overseas and in the private sector as well in the US. They've been thinking about these issues for a number of years. Obviously the insurance industry cares very de uh, dearly and uh, carefully about climate change. It affects policies they write and the underwritings they do. Um, financial institutions, obviously, um, when they provide credit or, or lending, they obviously have to think about climate change. But my thought was, how do we integrate the public sector and policymakers into this conversation so that we can have more of a public-private partnership and have more of a comprehensive look at financial risk as it relates to climate change? So in June of 2019, so about 14, 15 months ago, um, I held a public meeting at the CFTC. And I asked a few speakers to come, not unlike a congressional hearing, but really more of a uh, convening a bunch of speakers to talk about issues that I thought were important and had private sector and public sector participants, had academics, as well as some foreign regulators really talk about the work they've been doing uh, in this space and, and what potentially the CFTC and other financial regulators should be thinking about. After that public meeting in June, um, I put out a federal register notice in, in July to invite members of the public um, to participate on an advisory panel, a subcommittee. Uh, and over the next three or four months, we had a number of uh, um, you know, public citizens and institutional uh, representatives participate and volunteer their time and, and ask to be a part of the committee. Um, and in about mid-November of 2019, I was really proud to announce the, the final sort of formation of the, the subcommittee to, to, to examine climate risk as it relates to financial markets. We'll hear a little bit from, from Bob uh, shortly. Bob is the chair of the committee, and I, I want to say a few words. I couldn't have been more pleased um, that Bob was willing to volunteer his time. Um, he, is, he is stretched thin in many respects. He, he volunteers his time uh, on many boards, uh, in addition to working at Kepos. But uh, Bob's professional background is quite unique, and it really fits perfectly within the context of what I was trying to achieve, of sort of you know, threading the needle and examining financial markets and climate change. Uh, Bob's experience as a risk manager at Goldman, also as an institutional investor, and then uh, more recently at Kepos, and, and the way he sort of devoted much of his uh, personal time and professional time to climate change sort of manages that intersection perfectly. Um, he's also well known in this space, so I think he really brought a lot of credibility to the, to the committee and, and raised the bar for the 34 members. So in the end, after many, many months of hard work um, and going through the pandemic, uh, 
the committee was able to produce a report which was released two weeks ago. Uh, 53 policy recommendations, eight chapters, a very comprehensive report that looks at the full scope of, of financial market risk. And two things I'd like to point out sort of before I wrap up, uh, as Bob and I were having conversations in the, the middle and the latter part of 2019 before the committee really kicked off, I asked two things of him and I think he agreed with me and he could probably speak to these things is I wanted to have a diverse subcommittee. <laughs> so if you look at the subcommittee membership, the 34 members, um, there are much like the constituency of the CFTC, a representative from every part of the real economy. We have large financial institutions, we have institutional investors, we have representatives from agriculture, energy, academia, uh, public interest, um, environmental interests, exchanges, clearinghouses, data providers. So a really large span of members that I think builds a strong foundation for the committee to work from, and I think brings a lot of uh, credibility to the report and the findings that it, it eventually made uh, in the final document two weeks ago. The second thing was to uh, ask Bob to really take a holistic look at financial markets. Uh, derivatives markets are a key part of financial markets, um, but they are only one part. And I think you know one lesson I took from 2008, and then we're even seeing in, in the COVID pandemic in the March-April period where markets were particularly volatile, um, financial markets are very inter interconnected. And if you pull on a thread of one, whether it's derivatives or equities or fixed income, um, or the cash markets themselves, it's gonna affect all markets around them, both domestic and global. So uh, I asked Bob and I thought it was important to really do a comprehensive look, which in the end, this report touches on matters within the CFTC's jurisdiction for sure, but really provides recommendations across the board for both prudential regulators and, and other market regulators. So uh, among many, which I know Bob will speak about, the number one recommendation is the price on carbon. Um, in addition, it makes very firm statements about how climate change poses uh, um, uh, uh, systemic risk to the financial system. Uh, it talks about disclosures and stress testing under different climate scenarios. And the one thing that I'm very excited about and I hope we can discuss is the final chapter, which talks about how do we finance the net zero economy. So as much as this is a risk report uh, and the bulk of it is about risk and the risk to the financial system and how we need to build a more resilient financial system to stand up on our, our economy and, and continue a, a growing productive economy, it also presents a lot of opportunities, opportunities for investment, opportunities for creating better incentives so that uh, capital can be allocated um, to the transition in a smart, effective way and giving both investors, um, you know, institutional and retail an opportunity to take part in what I hope is going to be a sort of 21st century economy um, going forward. So I'll end there. Look forward to the conversation and, and questions uh, uh, later on. Commissioner, I have to admit that I think you did such a good job laying the foundation for this discussion that if it's all right with the panelists, I'd love to just move into the Q&A and we can kind of tease out your backgrounds as we go. Um, sure. Because I think you just, you really just laid out a very rich uh, landscape for this conversation. So I'd like to, to capitalize on it. Um, sure. So you, and you kind of got into this in, in, your, in your intro, but um, why did the commission sponsor the report? Was there a deciding factor? Was it timing? Uh, because it, seems very timely that it's come out just now. Well, I, in terms of timing, you know, I, I, as I mentioned, I've been thinking about climate change for a, a long time. And then when I started at the commission in 17, I started to sort of put the pieces of that larger puzzle together, have, have, had a lot of conversations with my domestic counterparts and then also folks overseas. There's a number of individuals and institutional bodies that have been thinking about this. So in terms of the advisory committees, you know, I, I want to certainly uh, appreciate the support of my fellow commissioners, but, you know, we're, we're able as individual commissioners to, you know, sponsor these advisory committees to raise and elevate issues that we individually care about. And then we obviously have to go to the, to the rest of the commission for support. So you make a good point that, you know, every action I take, whether it was having that public meeting in 2019 or the final announcement of the committee in November of 2019, I uh, had to get commission approval, which means you know a majority vote from from my fellow commissioners. Uh, but you know we're an independent agency, we're collegial, we work together, um, focusing really on the changing climate and how it affects our constituents and how it's affecting financial markets. And I think um, the way I laid out uh, the mandate and the charge of the subcommittee was compelling enough to my fellow commissioners, both Republicans and Democrats, that this was something to worry about and think about, at least from a policy perspective, so that we can get a better sense from stakeholders. 
whether it's the, you know, again, the farmers and ranchers who for years have been dealing with drought or flood or any number of things, um, or now what we're seeing out west, uh, obviously with the wildfires, uh, and you think about the Central Valley in California, but of course, um, you know, insurance companies use our markets to, to hedge interest rate risk and currency risk. Large banks use our markets, obviously, for uh, uh, liquidity providers as, as well as hedging risk in a number of products. And as lenders, both commercial and private, they have to think about climate risk. So our constituency is broad, and I just sort of emphasize that because um, climate touches a lot of our stakeholders, and I think. That's why the CFTC is a, both a unique agency, but the right venue to have this. And in terms of final product, you know, I had to get, I, I think Bob probably can answer that better. The, the committee worked really hard and through the pandemic, uh, and that it really is a remarkable thing and a testament to their work and dedication, both the individuals and the institution. Um, but, you know, climate is obviously becoming a, a more relevant issue, thankfully. It's been around for decades, but I think people are starting to, um, pay more attention, unfortunately, because of what we're facing in the country. Um, and we're seeing it every year and every day, and it's growing uh, in importance. And I think people uh, are starting to understand and appreciate that it's time to act. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, and speaking of, of the things that we're kind of seeing play out in the news, I think this is a great segue to Ambassador Rooney. Florida is facing significant risks from, from climate change, whether it's ocean acidification or rising sea levels. Um, and you've been a leading supporter of carbon pricing in Congress, and you've sponsored carbon pricing legislation as a Republican, which makes you very unique uh, in our current in our current circumstances. Fairly rare species. Very rare. Very rare, but um, how? So, in that in that context, how did you make the case to your colleagues? How did you get them to come to the table? What what have you found really kind of engages them in a way um, that perhaps maybe they hadn't been as engaged before? Yeah, to to kind of echo what the commissioner was saying, I, I've kind of made a personal crusade to try to show Republicans that, from a political point of view, with younger voters, and from it's the right thing to do point of view for financial and other uh, damage risks that climate change poses, we've got to get onto the table. You know, we used to be in the climate debate. Nixon started the EPA. Both Bushes expanded the Clean Air Act. But all of a sudden in the last eight years or 10 years or something, uh, Republicans have, have left the environmental discussion entirely. And I think that's a real mistake. Uh, in Florida, we're ground zero. Irma, you mentioned uh, orange juice. Irma wiped out our orange uh, crop that year. We had a lot of companies go out of business. It, they probably would default on their hedges and things like that. Um, with the, the I've, I've tried to explain to the leadership about the deep ocean heat content and how we're going to have bigger storms. I think people in Florida are starting to realize that after Hurricane Mike. When, when you look at this storm that went from a category two to a category five or category one to category four in 12 hours off of uh, Louisiana, that shows you how warm the water's gotten. The tropical Gulf or the tropical Atlantic in the Gulf is warmer than it's ever been recorded. So, um, you know, for someone from Florida, you've got to be paying attention to this stuff. The, the sea level rise is threatening our mangrove barrier. And if it continu continues to do that, then we will have saltwater invasion all through the Everglades. There are people that are starting to say now, we might as well forget the Everglades because it's going to become saltwater and the grass is going to die anyway. The, the uh, Obviously, the things I've been working on to save the Everglades uh, involve pushing fresh water south to help combat that and, and clean up the water in the grasses. But we've got, you know, the Pinnacamp Park, all the corals dead because of coral bleaching. The temperature in the water is too hot. So we've, we've got a lot of risks in Florida due to uh, the, the climate. Well, I think that that's, that's such a great point that, that Republicans really have been abdicating a lot of ground in this conversation for many years. And I think the House Republican Conference seems like they're beginning to flirt a little bit with some climate action, um, but they're not approaching it like they approach other systemic kind of financial challenges like tax code efficiency. How do you think we can shift that perspective to general? Well, I think we need to continue to keep the heat up. I mean, I was glad to see BP endorse a carbon tax last week. Uh, Shell did a, a long time ago. You know, I keep showing McCarthy and these guys all the stuff about the Alliance for Market Solutions, which is basically CEOs, every former head of the uh, Council of Economic Advisors, George Schultz, Jim Baker. You know, there's a lot of people with credibility that are Republicans that are in this space. But 
and, and you're right, a few people have said a couple of comments, like maybe grow, grow some more trees, you know, the carbon sink of trees, et cetera, uh, Brad Westerman's deal, but no one's been willing to really get out there and say, we've got to value price carbon, we've got to uh, deal with resilient, re resiliency measures to, uh, to affect uh, sea level rise and things like that. No one will talk about that. Well, I'm glad that you're willing to talk about it because it is important. And as we often say at the Scandon Center, we want durable solutions, legislative solutions, and then that means that they're bipartisan um, in many cases. So we really appreciate uh, your support in this in this area. Yeah, I might make one more comment. You take Absolutely. this bill that's coming up this afternoon. You know, I don't disagree with the substance of it. There's a lot of good things in it, but then they they go and they put all this other pork in it, and it makes it really hard fiscally to accept. You know, it's kind of like some of the gun stuff. If they would just do the core things, it could get bipartisan support. And I don't know what's going to happen this afternoon. I'm looking at it right now. Thank you There's for taking- There's a lot in it that I don't like. Thank you for taking uh, time to be with us. I know that you have uh, a lot on your plate today. Uh, with that, I'm going to pivot a little bit uh, to Bob Litterman. Um, and I think that this kind of carries on with uh, a lot of what the ambassador was saying that people seem to view climate change as kind of a slow burn annoyance until they don't. Um, and your report identifies climate change as a major threat to the stability of the US financial system. Um, and for a layperson, the US financial system is, is pretty complex. Can you help us unpack what the report means and what kinds of risks this entails? Sure, I'll, I'll try. And, and first of all, let me thank you, uh, Kodiak and Niskanen for hosting this webinar. And uh, just in the interest of full disclosure, I should point out perhaps that I'm the chairman of the board of Niskanen Center. And so very pleased to be here. Uh, and I think uh, Commissioner Benham did a great job of introducing you know, the report and how it got started. When he came to me uh, uh, about a year, well, over a year ago, I guess it was, uh, I was really quite surprised that uh, someone would be trying to set up such a report and such a committee. Uh, and it just seemed uh, that my background was very well suited. Uh, I led many risk committees in my days, starting back at Goldman Sachs 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And, uh, and uh, you know, climate is a risk management problem. And when you focus on it from a risk management perspective, a lot of things become very clear. There's many dimensions to the problem, but the fundamental flaw is that we don't have the right incentives in the markets. And frankly, everyone in the financial community understands that. It's, it's not just the financial community, but certainly uh, the financial community. And that includes, as the commissioner mentioned, everyone from uh, some oil companies, Conoco Phillips was on the committee and BP, uh, agricultural companies, uh, academics, environmental folks, investors, asset owners. And I remember at the first meeting uh, when we went around the table and I, one of the things commissioner did not mention, he mentioned we wanted a diverse committee and he mentioned that we wanted to take this uh, broad view. He also asked us to try and come up with a consensus report, basically said, see what you can agree on. And I wasn't sure what we would agree on, where the fault lines might lie. It was amazing how much we agreed on. He also asked for a high level report. He didn't want us to you know, reinvent everything and uh, it was hard for us to keep it high level and to keep it under 50 pages, which is what he asked for. At the end of the day, we had more than 50 recommendations. Uh, but the first one, and you asked about it, and I'm going to underscore it, it's so important. Uh, the first recommendation is that the U.S. Uh, you know, uh, has to price carbon. We have to create those appropriate incentives. Financial markets are incredibly efficient at allocating capital in the directions of the incentives that they're given. I was a financial engineer for decades on Wall Street. I used derivative instruments and you know fancy computer models to figure out how to make a profit from every little opportunity uh, in the markets. And, and those opportunities arise when risks are not priced appropriately. And that's the fundamental problem. It's not a problem that financial markets can solve on their own. Uh, we're talking about the externality, which are the damages created by uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but also the risk. The risk is beyond the expected damages. The risk refers to the full potential of outcomes. And in financial markets, we often talk about extreme but plausible scenarios. We have to be prepared for those. Uh, 
In the financial markets, we have a lot of history that tells us what are the probabilities of getting you know, outsized events. And you know, back when I was uh, head of risk management at Goldman, we used to say, you know, we're gonna see one of these four standard deviation events at least once a year. And that's much more than the normal distribution. We worried about those fat tails, about those really damaging uh, events. The difference with respect to climate is we don't have that history. What we do know is that the impacts are increasing year over year over year. And in fact, they're gonna increase for the next 50 years. If we slam on the brakes, and that's what we have to do, this is not an ease on the brakes scenario. And the break, the only break we have is the incentive that we create as a society to reduce emissions. And it has to be globally harmonized. This isn't just a US problem, but right now, what Americans have to understand is that the Europeans are way ahead of us the Asians are ready to go, and what they're waiting for is the U.S. We are the stumbling block. And the final thing I want to say is about risk management. Time is not on our side. Time is a scarce resource. When you're in risk management, we can solve anything if we have enough time. But I've seen many situations in my career where we didn't get started soon enough. And we've all seen what happened with COVID. And you know, there was a Columbia University study that one week delay in addressing the COVID crisis created double, more than double the number of deaths. And here we are with respect to climate, we should have done this 20 years ago. We should be well on the road to uh, addressing this and we haven't yet started. We don't have the incentives in place, emissions keep growing, the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere keeps increasing and every year of delay means that there's more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. This is a liability for our kids. It means that the ultimate temperature is gonna be that much higher. And I'll tell you how much higher. Every three years of delay is another 10th of a degree in the ultimate temperature that's gonna be reached. And that is a great, uh, what we call summary statistic for the risk that we're creating, that the maximum temperature. There may be a tipping point beyond which things become nonlinear. That's the kind of risk that uh, is being addressed in this report. It's an existential risk to the society and that includes uh, the financial markets. And we've got to prepare. And the first thing in the committee <laughs> was unanimous in supporting this recommendation, which they called the most important, is to create those incentives. So I'll stop there, Kodiak, but it's a very serious message from the entire financial community to Congress. We can't solve this on our own. This is Congress and they have to do this with urgency. And that's why I was so glad to see the uh, Business Roundtable report last week. Uh, uh, thank you so much for that, that insight. And you actually uh, gave me such a great pivot because I'd like to bring uh, Matt into the conversation, uh, especially on your point about competitiveness. So the Business Roundtable recently released um, a new policy platform on climate change and congratulations on that, Matt. Um, how is the business community seeing the risks that are articulated in this subcommittee report that Bob was just talking about, and then the opportunities for clean energy and climate action, because it seems that to stay competitive as a nation, we have this great opportunity. How can you address that? What do you think the business community is ready so, to do for that? So, oh yeah, let me do two things. Let me first just make sure everyone knows what it is that Business Roundtable put out last week, and then let me respond to the question about um, competitiveness here. Uh, so Business Roundtable is an association of uh, roughly 200 CEOs of America's top corporations. Um, and last week, we updated our view on climate change. We, we had already been the first major multi-sectoral organization to recognize climate change as a challenge, call for collective action um, more than a decade ago. Uh, but we hadn't talked about how, from a policy perspective, can we put an incentive to start ratcheting down uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. economy and to drive towards a global goal. So uh, the first thing we did was was clarify which goals we support. Uh, we, we lined up with uh, the Paris Agreement goals of holding global temperature rise to well below two degrees Celsius by the end of this century and reducing U.S. greenhouse gas emissions on net by at least 80 percent by 2050. Uh, we put forward 11 different policy principles that uh, we think should drive policymaking in this space. Uh, and then we put forward our preferred path to achieve all of this uh, that begins with, but doesn't stop at, um, 
uh, instituting a market-based mechanism that puts a price on carbon where effective, uh, both from an economic and an environmental perspective, and where administratively feasible, which is probably most, but not every source uh, across the US economy in the way that you might construct it. Uh, one of the principal concerns that our members has had and one of our, our driving principles as we've done this has been thinking about uh, our competitiveness, um, both in this space, but also broadly, as you think about the impact of climate change and climate policy on the competitiveness of the economy as well. I think we all know, as and as um, I think uh, previous speakers have spoken to far more eloquently than I, the costs of climate change are not zero. Um, and business is starting to be able to quantify those costs more and more uh, as they're seeing some of the impacts of increased severe weather, of increased wildfires, uh, et cetera. Um, so as we're, and, and of course, we're seeing those not just from the bottom line of perspective of business income itself, but also thinking about the impact on the stakeholders that matter so much to American corporations, whether it's our customers, uh, it's our employees, our investors, uh, or the communities uh, where we're located, which for some of my members, I think of Walmart's uh, currently their CEO's chairman of our board. Of course, they're in virtually every community around the country. Um, so, so this is something that matters a great deal. The question is then, how do we do this, recognizing it's a global challenge, that if we lower American emissions, but everybody else's emissions go up, we don't solve the problem. In fact, we don't end up doing anything significant at all. Um, and that there's policy impact from putting a price or a cost on carbon in the economy um, that could impact American businesses as they sell abroad. And so this is why for us, it's been so important to think about um, different methods of adjusting how this works across borders, um, thinking about how we improve international engagement on this issue so that we can, uh, while demonstrating leadership on it, which is critical for the United States to do, uh, help bring along better international partners in what they're doing. Uh, I think Bob was exactly right to call out how the Europeans are ahead of us in thinking about some of these policy levers. But when we think about where global GHG emissions are likely to rise over the coming decades, uh, Europe and we are, are in a generally the right direction, maybe not the right degree that we want to get there um, on our own, but uh, headed in the generally the right direction. Um, other parts of the developing world are going in the opposite direction right now. Uh, and if we don't create incentives that drive innovation to bring down the cost of reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere globally, uh, we won't solve the global challenge. And that's why this price signal is so important to driving that innovation um, and bringing new technologies to market. It's not just a question of changing the energy mix, which is important and which is happening and which needs to continue. Uh, it's more about what are we going to do across lots of different industries lots of different activities that we have economically uh, and make this cost effective uh, whether you're in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, South Asia, or the United States. Matt, it sounds like this price signal that you just mentioned and that Bob spoke about as well and as did the congressman. Um, is, this, is this price signal an example of a policy that would actually help American businesses stay ahead and stay competitive? We think so, uh, and we wouldn't we wouldn't support it if we didn't. Um, there, there's a number of studies that are out there. I can think of some that Brookings has thrown together for us to look at. You all have done some great work at Niskanen and others um, that show that you can, um, and it, it does have to do a little bit with what you do with revenue, but you can put a, a price on carbon, and there are different policy measures to do that. Um, and you can do it in such a way where if you are investing it the right way, at the same time, especially if you raise revenue, you have to reinvest that revenue effectively. Um, you can create either negligible impact on the economy from the policy itself or even net growth. Um, and that's pretty impressive uh, when you think about it. Uh, there's not a lot of ways for, for Congress to think about um, something like this that creates net growth, but it is possible in the way that you design this. We also see just an incredible market that's growing around the world for uh, low GHG and other GHG reduction technologies 
um, I think about in one space right now that sort of come to light because of the Kegley, Kegley Amendment to the Montreal Protocols um, when it comes to refrigerants and uh, hydrofluorocarbons. This is an area where the United States doesn't uh, enjoy a technological advantage. Um, and we could see that happen more and more in these technologies if we have the incentives to start developing them here first. Thank you, uh, gentlemen, so much for such a thoughtful discussion and for um, graciously answering my questions. I'm going to now turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Joseph Mikett, who's the Director of Climate Policy at Niskanen, to ask our first guest question before we move into the audience Q&A. Joseph? Uh, thank you, Kodiak, and thank you, everybody who uh, made it out today, both our panelists and our attendees. Uh, I'll remind everybody, if you have questions for the panelists, feel free to insert them into the chat and, and we'll make sure that they get to Kodiak. Um, my question is for the, for the commissioner and then for everyone broadly, there's a little nugget in your remarks about other barriers to financing a net zero economy, right? If we want to deal with climate change with the, the speed and the urgency that, that Bob and everybody has, has talked about today, um, what are those other barriers and, and what are the policy tools that you think should sit alongside uh, a carbon price to, uh, to, to help financial markets uh, create a, a net zero economy? Uh, thanks um, for that question. A couple things come top of mind is obviously the carbon price, which you mentioned. I think that shifts incentives um, and, and obviously uh, shifts capital allocation to, to newer technologies. Fiscal policy could play a huge role. Um, there are, and I'm not, I'm not an expert in obviously tax policy, not, I'm not an expert in tax policy, but certainly I, I'm aware of certain tax policies, fiscal policies that are geared more towards um, different uh, um, energy and, and uh, industries. And I think if we create different incentives in, the, in, in, our, in our fiscal policy, that could certainly create a new investment and a different um, allocation of capital. And one thing I'll mention from a markets perspective, which I'm sure a lot of your, your, your listeners are aware of, is this, um, this growth of the ESG um, investment portfolio. Um, the E, the S, and the G are very different. Um, so I, I will focus on the E part of it, but I, I want to emphasize how they're all different because that's in part an issue and something that the report addresses is there's a lot of demand from retail and institutional investors um, to uh, allocate uh, investment capital towards uh, you know, ESG type products. Um, but I think what we have now, the report um, validates this, Bob could probably speak to it, but from my perspective, knowing this both before the report was produced and then looking at the findings, uh, of the report that um, we as a regulatory community and I think as a private sector together, because the private sector is doing a lot in this space, need to clarify um, what ESG is, need to sort of create a set of common terms, create a set of uh, common matrix so that both investors and the regulatory com community can, um, I think, further build out this suite of investment products so that retail and institutional investors can avail themselves of it with more confidence, knowing what they're investing in, um, what activities the um, issuers are, are partaking in that makes them qualified to be an ESG um, uh, investment product. Um, so I think that's a very exciting part. I know this has been an, an issue and there's two sides to this, certainly debate about um, what constitutes ESG, what shouldn't what constitutes sort of material climate risk, which kind of falls into that, is something ESG or not? These are all good questions and things that I think uh, the public sector and the regulatory community need to take a, a, a participate in. The private sector has been doing a lot, I'll end on that. Um, there's a task force for uh, climate related financial disclosures, it's run by the Financial Stability Board. There's other private sector um, efforts to sort of define uh, what constitutes ESG, but I think um, in addition to f fiscal policy and then the price on carbon, um, that could actually uh, be a good incentive to uh, create uh, more opportunities for the economy. Thank you, Commissioner. Would any of our other panelists like to answer Joseph's question, or shall I move on to Alex Flynn's question? Let's keep it rolling. Great. Then I'll turn it over to Alex Flint at uh, Alliance for Market Solutions for our next question. 
There we go. Sorry about that. It's, it's good to see you all. This is fascinating. I appreciate the opportunity to ask you some questions. Uh, Bob and Commissioner, there's a line in the report that reads, a sudden revision of market perceptions about climate risk could lead to a disorderly repricing of assets. And, and that reminded me of something in Larry Fink's letter to his CEOs uh, in January in which he said, and because capital markets pull future risk forward, we will see changes in capital allocation more quickly than we see changes to the climate itself. And I'm wondering about how you see those issues working together, this uncertainty about how the markets will, will respond to the risk and markets tendency, at least according to Larry Fink, to pull the, those risks forward. And so, Bob, you mentioned timing in your statement. I'm just, how do you see these things playing out uh, in, the, in the coming years? Yeah, so that, that's a great question, Alex. And I think, you know, first of all, we sometimes distinguish between transition risks and physical risks and the physical impacts of climate versus the impacts on the valuations of securities. And uh, so uh, some folks are very concerned about whether or not the financial markets will kind of all of a sudden realize, wow, this is much more serious than we thought. And therefore, uh, there'll be you know, sudden impacts on the valuation of securities. Frankly, I doubt that that's the case, but in this report, we have to worry about you know, unlikely but plausible scenarios. And I think if you go back you know, a little over 10 years ago and ask people, could uh, you know, subprime mortgages take down the economy, there were very few people who said, oh yeah, that's obviously a risk we have to worry about. And similarly here, could a sudden recognition that the risks of climate change are much worse than we realized, and maybe that the time that we have left to address them is much shorter than we expected. And instead of a smooth transition, we're gonna get a sudden transition. Yeah, that could have major impacts on valuations. Now, one reason I'm not so worried about that is because we've already seen tremendous impacts on valuations. You know, the energy sector has underperformed the rest of the economy every year now for, I don't know, at least uh, five years, maybe 10 years. And uh, I've been investing, uh, looking forward toward, uh, you know, the lower valuations of stranded assets, fossil fuels and other, you know, uh, assets that depend on uh, fossil fuels uh, and, and looking uh, to invest in uh, the sustainable sectors of the economy. And that's been doing very well for, for a number of years now, which also addresses the issue of ESG investing that the commissioner mentioned a, a few minutes ago. Uh, you know, taking account of what's likely to happen due to climate change is uh, a way to improve the returns and lower the risk of a portfolio. And so that's what a lot of investors are doing. And it, it makes perfect sense. Uh, it makes sense for environmental factors. It also makes sense for social and governance factors. Any factor that affects the risk and return of a portfolio should be taken into account. That's just, you know, any financial factor and climate and social and governance factors are factors that affect the distribution of outcomes uh, for every corporation. So all of this is something that needs to be taken into account. Uh, but I, you know, you've already seen uh, a lot of impact on valuations of securities. And the real question for investors at any point in time, including right now, is, is it all built in? Or is there a significant repricing yet to go uh, forward? Now, I think there is. I think that the, the pricing has not all been built in. I think the real bet that we're making these days is about how quickly is the transformation going to happen? I think most investors realize there's going to be a transformation to a low carbon economy over the next 30, 40, 50 years. The question is, when do we get started and how rapid is it? And that's all a function of pricing. It comes down to the incentives that we create. So if we create those incentives right now, there's going to be a phase change in the economy. You know, instead of economic agents following the incentives that they're given toward the old economy, toward the fossil fuel economy, they're all going to be, whether they realize it or not, they're going to have the incentives to move in the direction of the low carbon economy. And that's going to affect at the margin, every decision made by investors, by businesses, by asset owners, by consumers, by entrepreneurs, uh, 
And that's what's going to create the phase change. And we're going to see a sudden and rapid movement toward a low carbon economy. And sh I think that's where investors should be placing their chips, so to speak. Well, thank you to both Alex and Joseph for those great questions to get us started. And speaking of phase changes, I think this segues nicely into our first audience question. And I'll pose this uh, to Ambassador Rooney. Um, what is the role of young people in addressing climate risk? And I think uh, to the point about phases, young people are very concerned about this. We hear a lot about millennial and Gen Z action um, and they will become voters. They are voters. So uh, Ambassador that has, that has exactly been my argument to Kevin and previously to Paul Ryan that we have got to look at the polling data, look at the uh, comments that the young people make, look at the uh, number of people taking environmentally related courses in college and, and recognize that we've got to get a seat at that table. And it's clear, I've given them all kinds of polling. I mean, uh, it's, I've got an article that I gave McCarthy, I even put it in the record of the Rules Committee that seven out of 10 millenniums, millennials vigorously oppose offshore drilling. And, and here we won't do anything, you know. Uh, I would like to see more young people write op-eds and speak up. Uh, I would like to see some young people congratulate BP and Shell and the Alliance for Market Solutions for corporate America getting behind climate change. Um, I think I don't, I, I can tell you from going out in the field, people do not understand the deep ocean heat content. And that's going to take some of you smart think tank folks to educate a lot of people because that's the a big risk for our storms. But the young people will be a catalyst if we can mobilize them. I, I, I've tried to, and you all can certainly do that too. Well, Master, uh, you've just oh, go one, ahead, Matt. one second. Um, young people are having an interesting impact as new employees. Um, this is a driving factor for many of our business members at Business Roundtable, is that it's very difficult to recruit employees, particularly if you're trying to get highly talented individuals in engineering and other spaces like that. There's such competition for the, that brain power. Um, if your company doesn't have a good record and a good position on this issue, uh, you're gonna have a hard time recruiting them. So I, I can, I can address that a little bit too. The, the, uh, one of our businesses is a very large, several billion dollar year construction company. And the whole lead movement, the whole movement towards sustainable hardscape, where you don't grout brick and it drains down into filtered membranes and doesn't go into storm sewers. There are a lot of very practical, environmental, environmentally remediating things and the young people love it. And the first thing young people ask when we interview them is, tell me about your lead building experience. Well, it's always nice to hear the youth being touted as potentially part of the solution instead of just the problem. Um, our second audience question uh, is how do we turn, and I think Matt would be particularly well suited to, to answer this, but also potentially you, Ambassador. Um, how do we turn business support for these policies into action? So uh, let me start with, action is starting. Um, so, I mean, I mean, I get paid to represent these businesses, right? I've been all over Capitol Hill over the last few months talking about this issue as we've been able to clarify our view uh, we're starting to see more of it. A number of our members are very active on it. Um, but business will put more resources into a really strong effort as they see openings for getting something done. Um, and we've seen this on other issues in the past too, where business has cared a great deal. Um, I'll give you an example, one that's an obvious one. Business loved business tax reform, right? A few years ago, early in the Trump administration, huge boon to the economy. Um, but the resources to move that forward at the level that it did uh, came through in that moment when there, it, it appeared there was a window. And so we'll see more resources as windows open from a policy perspective. And I think right now it's important to start putting together the, the frameworks so that those windows can open. Um, and while the election is part of that, it's certainly not the only tool in, in helping to move that conversation forward. And I'm actually hopeful that there will be some windows coming forward here, uh, even uh, depending, uh, I, I just say, regardless of who wins uh, in November, uh, there's reason to think that this conversation has openings to advance over the coming uh, next few years. Well, I, I think having people like the Business Roundtable and the National Association of Manufacturers and stuff start to get into this discussion is very important too, because every town's got members, every town's got CEOs of local companies that are involved in that, 
and they can speak out locally as well as through the roundtable. Uh, I know the Alliance for Market Solutions has got a lot of really great CEOs. I know a few of them. Uh, they, none of them have been quite as prolific, in my opinion, as Hubbard, uh, Jim Baker, and, and of course, uh, uh, George Schultz. But we could try to mobilize a lot more people to get vocal in that area. Ambassador, oh, yeah, can I? Oh, go ahead. Sorry, just, I want to jump in, playing off a little bit about what uh, the ambassador said and Matt. This kind of goes back to what I said earlier about when I selected this committee, understanding how to how do we move past the politics of this issue, elevate the risks, the challenges. In my mind, that was really the driving force behind how I selected the committee. Um, I mentioned this earlier, Bob mentioned it as well, you know, whether it's dairy farmers of America or large financial institution, both domestic and international or ag or energy, uh, BP and Conoco, as Bob uh, posted or mentioned, you know, when you when you build that large classic sort of DC speak, if you build that large diverse coalition, it becomes pretty hard um, to refute as, as a policy that should at the minimum be considered, uh, and if not, um, pretty heavily debated. So uh, I just want to ag agree with what's been said, but sort of um, chime in that, you know, that was that certainly a driving force behind why I, I chose I think the members I did. One, uh, one minor reflection of how that can work is what we just got Trump to do in Florida, extending the ban on offshore drilling for 10 years. He doesn't care about that. It's not a policy issue for him. Look at his Department of Interior and EPA. But he's so worried about the politics of Florida that he did it. And I've been working on him for two years. And, and so we can be effective. All the, the, the fight now is the Senate and the administration. The House is going to stay Democratic, and they're our friends. Um, and all these senators have to get money from the CEOs in their state. They can't do it without it. And I think that the, most of them are your, some of y'all's members. Yeah, and if I could just add, uh, throw in my voice as well, you know, uh, Catherine Murdoch and I just took over as co-chairs of the Climate Leadership Council. And this is the sponsor of, you know, a bipartisan approach with uh, uh, George Schultz and Jim Baker. And uh, we have support from everyone, I like to say, from ExxonMobil to the World Wildlife Fund. And there are not a lot of people outside of that coalition. So it didn't surprise me that we have, you know, support from every economist, practically, from mm -hmm. all the corporations, business. We all know how important incentives are. Uh, you know, incentives change behavior. If you want to change behavior, sometimes people say to me, Bob, you're an economist, you think people are rational. It's not about rationality. <laughs> incentives change behavior and, and incentives in the market economy are prices and wages. And when we get that right, our, you know, the decisions will be moving in the right direction, whether uh, people are aware of it or not. And so it's so important and it's, and we have so much support. I think we're going to see this uh, you know, in the next, uh, after the election, there's going to be a discussion. I think we'll see uh, legislation in Congress. There's so many con congressmen, and I'm sure Ambassador Rooney knows this, who in the privacy of their own office will tell you, of course I understand. I know it needs to be done. I just don't want to, you know, bang my head against a brick wall. Well, when yeah, there's an opportunity to have a debate, I think we're going to see a, a very different Congress. I've had several Republican members say, I just can't get there. I understand coastal, coastal representatives even. And you know, one of them's just north of me. I said, you're gonna get flooded and you live on the beach. But I, I do think that um, uh, the Senate has to be the major argument. And those guys uh, are gonna have to break through some ideologies of their leadership that are gonna be pretty impermeable. Well, speaking of uh, the Senate, there's clearly a lot of variables at play. I think we're almost 40 days out from the election, so the landscape may look very different, um, but I think a lot of the points that you all have made really highlight the fact that these issues are very interconnected and they're complex, um, but building big coalitions uh, of stakeholders who are willing to have thoughtful conversations about it uh, is, is, a critical, is a critical part and something that Niskanen uh, values highly. So we are down to five minutes and I think we have time for one final question. Uh, and Bob, you'd actually provided another great pivot for this question. Um, and it comes from an audience member asking, what other policies incentivize people or institutions to take on too much climate risk and what can we do to undermine those? 
What other policies? Well, uh, there's certainly many, many policies. First of all, incentives come in many forms. So a carbon tax is what we typically think of, and that's a central policy. But you know, there's there's feed-in tariffs, there's uh, renewable portfolio standards, there's uh, gasoline taxes are an incentive that you know puts a price on carbon. It wasn't the intention, but they do. So there's all kinds of incentives. As the commissioner talked about earlier, there's many things uh, that we can do in the financial markets, uh, better standards, uh, better metrics. Uh, there are derivatives uh, that uh, can be used for both uh, hedging climate risk and also revealing information about expectations of future prices and so on. And uh, so all of these things in the investment community, uh, there are all kinds of investment products now, and there is tremendous demand for these uh, sustainable investments or impact investments or ESG investments. That's the largest growing sector of the asset management uh, world right now. Yeah. So many things can be done. There may be an opportunity for some of these less developed nations like Brazil, who's burning up every day, to use the old Brady Bond idea too. I don't know, Bob, what you think about that? Yep. No, absolutely. There's all kinds of, we can talk about carbon assets. Investors can invest in uh, carbon allowances. They can invest in uh, projects that remove CO2 and that get, uh, you know, beneficial treatment for that in, in many venues. So a lot of things are developing very quickly. I would say from an ec economist's point of view, if you're going to charge people, whatever, call it $50 a ton for putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, then you should certainly be willing to pay someone who can pull it out for $10 a ton. And so we should develop all of those market mechanisms as well. Well, I'd like to take a moment uh, to thank our panelists uh, and our attendees for spending part of your morning with us. Uh, having worked in climate change for about the last 18 months, I can tell you this conversation is not always uplifting, but I found this discussion this morning incredibly thought provoking uh, and also optimistic. I think when you have leadership like the kinds that you all have demonstrated in this space, um, a solution has to be just on the horizon. Um, and I appreciate all the work that you all are doing to help uh, bring that to fruition. And thank you uh, for taking time out of your schedules to be with us. Uh, Ambassador, I know you're you know, carefully considering the energy package on the House floor, so we appreciate if that. This, if this energy bill were more like what Bob just described, carrots instead of sticks, it would be a no-brainer. The problem is the Democrats always default to, let's just use government money and, and misallocate capital. If they would do exactly what you said, we could have a fantastic bill here. And well, let's, see, let's see what happens. I'm optimistic. Yeah. Well, and this is exactly why we'll miss your leadership, Ambassador. So thank you to all our attendees, and we apologize for the questions we weren't able to get to. Um, but there will be a recording uh, of the session available on the Niskanen Center website, and also it will be emailed out to everyone who registered. Thank you again for your participation today. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Thanks.